Uh, we are in the Montana Historical Society in the State Archives. Uh, the Archives is one of three programs that makes up the Research Center here at the Historical Society. So today we're going to be talking about uh, Jeanette Rankin. Um, she was a woman from Montana, the Missoula area actually, born in 1880. Her biggest claim to fame is that she was the first woman elected to the United States Congress. That was in 1916. She was elected again in 1939, just before we got into World War II. So she served two different terms, but lots of years in between them. Jeanette Rankin, um, when she came into the Congress, she came in with a bit of fanfare. So there was a bit of a honeymoon in which she um, was given a standing ovation when she walked into Congress. Um, she was given flowers. So it was a very positive time for her. Um, that quickly ended, however, <laughs> when she voted no for um, entry, the U.S. entry into World War I. This is a letter from Anna Garland Spencer. Uh, she's from Meaderville, uh, Pennsylvania. And in it, she talks about how difficult that it must have been being the first woman uh, in Congress, period, but then also being the first one to have to say no to war. It would have been so much better and easier for you if two or more women had been inaugurating element of our sex. Then, as there would not probably have been an entire agreement between them, the responsibility would have been divided, and you would have stood not for womanhood, but only for Miss Rankin, in your first most serious vote. But I'm sure that others will be with you later and that in any case your sincerity and right feeling will win the confidence of your comrades. One of the places that Jeanette Rankin took the, the worst beatings, if you will, was in the press. Um, and there, Unfortunately, um, the, the newspapers in Montana were largely owned and operated by the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, and they were very pro-war. So a lot of the newspapers in Montana really, as I said, vilified her. And there's an old saying about um, death by a thousand cuts, and I just wanted to provide one example of the slights that she, uh, Jeanette Rankin, experienced all over the state. This particular one, um, she was supposed to sell Liberty Bonds, uh, give a presentation and sell Liberty Bonds in Butte, and when she got there, the doors were locked against her, and she tried to figure out why they weren't letting her in, and basically they said, uh, we have no knowledge that you were supposed to be here. Her response, of course, was to stand in front of the building and give her speech anyway. <laughs> so uh, it, it shows that she definitely had uh, the wherewithal and the, the spine to be able to handle all of these uh, cuts, the death of a thousand cuts. But if you think about this, every town she went to, um, every time she went to give a speech, these kinds of slights were given to her. Despite the rocky start to her term, uh, Jeanette Rankin actually did a great deal. Um, she was the woman to um, put forward the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which eventually became the 19th Amendment, giving women suffrage. So that was one of the big things that she really wanted to have happen during her term. She also went, uh, tried to get child welfare reform in and uh, things like that. So there's a lot of issues that she worked towards. And I think one of the best examples of that fight for her relates to the speculator mine disaster that uh, occurred in 1917. In the disaster, um, 168 men were killed. And of course, that left many um, orphans and uh, women without any means of support. If there had been reforms within the mine, the safety of the miners would have been assured and the disaster would not have occurred at all. So um, I have one more piece I'd like to show you. It's sort of a call to arms telling Jeanette that she really needs to get to Butte and uh, to participate. It looks like your highest duty for you is to come instantly to investigate these conditions and methods firsthand. This knowledge will force Congress and others to immediate action and a new note shall be sounded in the industrial world. My plan demands big courage, big comprehension, and close discrimination. You can trust the people here. They will give you justice. This is a tremendous opportunity for even the biggest man in the nation. The workers here trust you. You are the biggest and most effective action that could come here. You cannot be too cautious. This is your hour to prove the quality of your courage and your justice. 
all is ready. So Jeanette did in fact go to Butte and she was um, greeted with open arms by the mining community. 10,000 strong attended her speeches. Unfortunately, she couldn't affect change and a lot of the information that came out of these rallies was twisted in the lens of uh, the company-owned um, newspapers. So the end result of all of this is that Jeanette Rankin um, knew full well in going that she was committing political suicide because if she crossed the company they weren't going to allow her to get elected again. And of course coming into the 1930s into 1940 we are again as a nation facing war and she believed that it was her duty to serve again. She did again run uh, and won. And of course the vote for war came up again and she voted her conscience once again and said I cannot go to war and therefore cannot send anyone to war. Um, this time she was the only vote against the war and that's of course the, the vote itself took uh, place after Pearl Harbor so the passions were very high. Um, there's this very poignant photo of her uh, sitting in the phone booth outside of Congress um, where she's taken refuge and she's called uh, for the guards to come and get her because she's afraid for her personal safety so she didn't run again. But I think what is really important in what you see throughout her records is that she was consistent in what she believed and she let people know that. And what's really extraordinary about her I think is the just the tenacity with which she fought for peace after she was out of office. So you look from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, she was again in organizations, um, peace organizations. She uh, traveled the world fighting for peace, and, and that, that is what she absolutely believed in, and she did to the day she died.